Hey all, how you doing? Okay, so what I want to do here is, um, you know, consciousness is such a big fuzzy thing and I've already talked about sort of how audacious it is for, you know, psychologists to think you can study it scientifically. I want to give you a taste for what that looks like. I want you to have a sense of that you can study things like attention and consciousness scientifically. Uh, and I want to give you some concrete examples as we go through this because, you know, so often discussions of consciousness seem a little um, abstract, let's say. Uh, and so every now and then having a really concrete sense of how somebody could scientifically investigate something can kind of, you know, make you feel um, a little more Oh, it just makes you it makes understanding a little easier. So that's the hope here. Um, I've called it experiments on attention and the conscious mind. Um, it, it really kind of connects a lot with lecture six one actually. So I kind of did six one and I talked about you know that way of talking and thinking about conscious and unconscious mind. Um, and then I had the diversion uh, of a little bit into mapping these onto the brain because I want you to see that connection with what you've learned about the brain. But now we're kind of going to well let's let's start here. And in fact, let me just fill this out with all the stuff we had here. Um, and so if we go back to this, I made some claims when I laid out this diagram. And I want to get you a sense of what those claims are based on. Um, and again, I think this will help us as we go through some of the other chapters to see how these various bits of psychology kind of interconnect. So, uh, you know, one of the claims, or, or I guess maybe the most auda audacious, audacious claims, or the most interesting claims, I got the word audacious in my head all of a sudden, um, the most interesting claims are with respect to the unconscious mind. First, the notion that we are perceiving without our awareness. Um, and then second, this notion that what we perceive without awareness can bias the way things appear in consciousness. So I threw that out there and you might have went, what? What's that about? I want to show you what that's about, and I, and I want you to leave this lecture with a sense of how the conscious and unconscious minds may interact um, in really important and interesting ways. I also want to kind of take you through the scientific journey, because what I'm actually showing you here is, is a representation of what, uh, what we currently believe. But we didn't always believe that. And, and I, want, I want to give you that sense of what we initially believed, which was that there was very little perception without awareness and very little influence of the unconscious mind. Um, and, and I'll tell you an experiment that kind of seemed to fit with that. But then I'll give you that next experiment that seemed to show, oh, but things are a little more complicated than it seems. So in a way, I'm also using this as an excuse to kind of come back to the scientific process and that notion that you've already practiced in your peer scholar activity that, yeah, you do an experiment and it seems to suggest something, but sometimes there's that next step. And, and that next step, if properly considered and cleverly designed, might change the way we think about things. So I want to take you on a journey where that kind of happened, okay? So the journey starts here. It's going to start with the work of somebody named Broadbent, uh, Don Broadbent, uh, in the 50s. And, you know, actually, let me step back here one more time and, and bring in this concept, attention. You know, I claim that attention brings things into the conscious mind. So what Broadbent was interested in, and, and before you look at the at the left part too much, let, let me just give you the, the sort of backstory. And the backstory was just this. Um, at the time of Broadbent, it was common to have cocktail parties. Um, so, professors, I guess, would work during the day and sometime in the evening there might be a party every now and then and they would all have their cocktails and they would be chatting away. So imagine one of those rooms, right, where everyone's talking and it's loud. The cocktails are not needed except this is called the cocktail party phenomenon. That's the only reason I mentioned that. Um, what Broadbent noticed was, wow, this is a whole bunch of noise going on, but people are able to kind of have conversations with with other people they're able somehow to selectively attend uh, to certain conversations and not to all of the rest so we can kind of focus our mind on certain conversations and he was curious about how we did that and that gave rise to the to the question I guess or the issue of selective attention how does the brain choose certain information uh, and attend to that information and how is it able to block out the other information and does it completely block out the other information 
Okay, so how can you take that cocktail party phenomenon and kind of bring it into an experimental lab? And so that phenomenon is, okay, there's multiple conversations or there's multiple things going on, but I want to focus in on one and ignore the others. Okay, Broadbent came up with this. It's something called the dichotic listening task using the shadowing procedure. So let me take that apart. Dichotic listening. What do we mean by that? Well, we have headphones. They had headphones in 1958. <laughs> um, so we have headphones. Uh, and that allows us to present different information to the left ear and to the right ear. And that's what we're showing here, that the left ear is, is hearing the meaning of life is and it's going on and on. The right ear I have, let me look at this right. The right ear, this is his right. The right ear is hearing the meaning of life. The left ear is hearing the yellow dog chased. And, and they continue, right? So each ear is getting independent words streaming at them, you know, sentences being read to them. And the first thing is we ask the participant to shadow one of the messages. And by shadow, what we mean is r right after you hear a word, say the word. Right. So as he's hearing the yellow dog chased, he's saying the yellow dog chased. So he's he's shadowing the message in one ear. What that does is it's forcing him into the cocktail party situation. Right. He's there. There's multiple conversations going on and we're saying, yeah, but 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 pay attention to the one in the left ear, the one about the dog. OK. And read and just keep reading that and try to block out that other message. Now, at first, people find this a little challenging. But it's amazing how quick and quickly and easily they can start to do this task. And in fact, what they report to you, and, and you could try, you could probably create this, I'm sure, online. Jeez, um, I should have looked. I bet there's dichotic listening stimuli online where you could just put on the headphones and give this a try. Um, what it feels like is that that message you're not attending to just seems to kind of go away. As, as your mind gets focused on the one you're attending to, uh, you just don't hear a lot in that other one. And in fact, when Broadbent asked people afterwards, did you notice anything in that unattended message? And, and he, was he was messing with it. So he was doing various things, and I'll mention some of these with the unattended message. Um, and, and let me just give you an example. Let's go right to this language, for example. What he would have is that the, the, the words that were in the unattended channel, the one you were not shadowing, at some point those words would change from English to French to various other languages and back to English. And he would ask people, hey, did you notice anything going on in that unattended ear? They would not notice things like language changes. No idea. They only noticed if one of two things happened. So the first one is pitch changes. If the message in that unattended ear, say, was originally read by a male and then um, a, a female kind of takes over at some point, they would notice that. So because the actual physical characteristic of the stimulus has changed, it's gone from a voice, you know, like mine that might be in a certain frequency range, um, and it's changed to a voice that's in a very different frequency range now, a higher frequency range if it was a, if it was a female. Uh, and that they notice. If you suddenly speed up the words, um, they'll notice that. So if you mess with the physical characteristics, you know, the actual frequency or, or speed of the message they notice. But if you do more subtle things, again, like changing the language or various other things, they don't even notice. And, and you know, mostly they'll say, I, I didn't even really hear that message after a while. I was just focusing on the attended message. Now, there's one other thing, and this kind of was part of the cocktail party phenomenon that intrigued people uh, a little bit. If that unattended message contains something of high personal relevance, and what this usually means is your name. So if, if that unattended message contained your name, um, often, not always, but often participants would notice that. Um, they would say, oh yeah, I heard my name a time or two. And so the notion was, okay, you're processing that unattended information a little bit, must be processing it a little bit in order to pick up the name, but maybe just a little bit, maybe just the physical characteristics. And in fact, that's Broadbent's, so Broadbent came up with what he called filter theory. And the idea was these messages are coming in, they're going into something we're going to call a sensory store. We'll talk about this in the memory chapter. Don't worry about that too much, but they're going to hit this filter. And the idea of Broadbent one is, is, is that this filter 
Now selects the things we're going to attend to. So in this case, we've told the person, attend to your left ear. And so this filters focuses our attention on the left ear and that only that message then goes through. Okay, and so this thing that would have to detect if anything's changed in the unattended, it doesn't really get a chance to detect it because there's only the attended message is coming through and that's what goes to memory. So people remember the stuff they attended to, they don't remember or, you know, any of those other things in the unattended channel. Uh, and so he, he proposed what we're going to call an early filter, meaning that it, the filter happened at a very physical level of processing, just the raw characteristics of the stimulus. And if, if that changed, somebody would notice, but otherwise everything else would just be filtered out. Okay. And so that's where we started on this journey. And, and the notion here is, okay, the things we're attending to, we think about and we remember, but the things that we don't attend to maybe just get lost. Right. However, call this experiment one. This is what we originally thought after Broadbent, but then a guy named Ike did an experiment, and there were a number of others. Um, somebody named Ann Treisman, by the way, <clears throat> did a bunch of great experiments in the 60s and uh, 50s, 60s. Uh, very well-known psychologist. Her work also shaped this. I like to highlight the Ike study because it's really clever. <laughs> I like clever. So let's move to the Ike study. Whoa, I don't know why it went all black there for a second, but there we are, Ike, 1984. So this is a ways down the line, right? So in those 20 years, people were trying to understand um, attention and, and um, well, conscious, the conscious mind, because it looked like, you know, that's all that got through. Um, the, the stuff you attend to gets to the conscious mind, that was it. People were saying, is that true? Okay, so here we are, dichotic listening task again. Um, I just wanted to show you another example of that. But here's the interesting situation we're going to do in this study. We are going to present words to the unattended ear. I have to go slowly here because it's tricky. So first of all, in the attended ear, this is the one they were shadowing, we were presenting single words. So in this case, despite the fact you're seeing sentences here, it wasn't sentences in this experiment. It was just single words. But at the same time, a word was presented in the left that they were attending to. Sorry, let me do it over here. Left that they were attending to. And at the same time, another word was presented in the right ear. Now, critically, the ones in the left were these words we call homophones. What we mean by that is we have the same sound, but that sound can, can be spelled. It's actually two different words. Whoops. So the word fair, for example, could be... Um, you know, being fair, like is the world fair to everybody? Is this, was the exam fair? Or it could be a fair, like you pay for a taxi, for example, which will be relevant. Similarly, male could be male you receive, or it could be male versus female, right? Air could be the air you breathe or the air to the throne. Mall could be the mall where you shop or a dog mauls somebody, right? Uh, and flee, it could be running away or it could be the little critters that go on dogs. Um, Notice all, I mean, critically, the, the person was just hearing the word. They weren't seeing the word. So in, in these cases, they would just hear fair, male, air, mall, flea. Critically, though, at the same time as they heard fair, in the unattended ear, they heard either taxi or paper. Okay, what's the difference? So some participants would hear taxi, some participants would hear paper. Um, taxi is what we call a prime. It's going to prime a specific meaning here. So taxi will suggest fare, F-A-R-E, paying the fare of the taxi. Boy will suggest the male as in male, female. Prince will suggest the heir to the throne. Bull, bulls maul people in bullfights. Uh, and ticks and fleas kind of go together. Uh, and so these primes are associated with specific ways of spelling that homophone, okay? The controls are not. So the controls are just neutral words that shouldn't push you towards one or the other way of thinking about this. And so we use the controls, by the way, just to get a sense if, okay, so yeah, let me, let me just finish the study and then we'll come back to that. So again, stepping through the study carefully, on every trial, 
the person would hear fair. Well, they would hear a word like fair in their attended ear. And then one of these in the unattended at the same time. Okay. And then they would hear mall, sorry, male in the attended ear and one of these air with one of these mall with one of these flea with one of these. Uh, and the list would continue. It would be longer, much longer than that. At the end of the list, we say, write down everything you remember. What are all the words you remember hearing? Okay. The first thing we notice, by the way, is they don't remember any of these words. Okay. Just like Broadbent said, it's like they never heard those words. Maybe, but let's just hang on here. Um, okay. Now, of course, when they're remembering the word, oh, I remember the word fair. The critical question we have is when they write it down, how do they spell it? Do they spell it like this or do they spell it like this? Because that's kind of telling us how they thought of the word when it appeared, right? When they heard the word fair, did they think like this, like a fair exam? Or did they think like a fair for a bus that you pay? Well, how do we know? Well, first of all, we can use these control items. So for some participants, that when they heard fair, they heard paper. When they heard mail, they heard trip. When they heard air, they heard ball. And so for these people, we can just find out, well, what's the likelihood of them using this or, or, or this, right? So one might be more common than the other. And so we can just find out the, the sort of chance likelihood of spelling the word a certain way. Then, critically, we look at these trials where the primes were in place. And we ask a very simple question. When you present, say, boy at the same time as they're hearing male, does that make them far more likely to, to write the word as M-A-L-E? When you ask them what they remembered, do they remember the version of this word that's been primed by that prime? <clears throat> and the answer is yes, they do at high rates. So by presenting these items, even though they don't hear them, even though they say they don't, they never heard them, that they don't remember them, nonetheless, if you present prints at the same time as they're hearing air, and then you say, write down what you heard, they will tend to write it this way, H-E-I-R. Um, the word prints seems to, even though they're not hearing it consciously, even though they don't remember it later, at that moment, it seems to bias how they're processing the information that they're processing consciously, which is the word air, right? So they heard that. Now, how do they think of it? Well, that depends on what's going on in the unattended channels. So I hope that all made sense with you. I wanted to go nice and slow here. So that is, is this part, right? When I say the things in our unconscious mind, yes, they can trigger these behaviors, habits and whatever, but they also bias the way the things appear in consciousness. Our unconscious mind um, affects how we ultimately perceive things in our conscious mind. And the previous experiment showed it. Let me give you an example from real life to try to make this make hopefully even more sense. There is a claim out there, and I don't know exactly what the data is based on, but there's a claim that 70% of our communication is nonverbal, um, that, it, that it comes through in our gestures and especially our face, the way we kind of hold our face when we say things, and that this nonverbal part is the part that the limbic system responds to, the emotional part of our brain, the unconscious mind. And so if somebody is telling you something, they're recounting some story, and it sounds pretty like, wow, like this is a wild, crazy story. One question that's going to go through your mind is, is this true? Is this person maybe lying to me? Um, and that is what the unconscious mind is really good at. The unconscious mind is good at sort of seeing the body language and detecting those signals that suggest that that person might be lying. Now, now, why would there be signals? Well, every time you lie, you're taking a risk, right? There's the potential that you'll get caught lying, and that'll lead to social embarrassment, all sorts of other things. So anytime we lie, we know that we're sort of flirting with danger. 
And we wear that a little bit on our face. We get a little bit of that fight flight reflex kicking in because there's a, I'm entering into a threatening situation. And for example, the muscles right here tend to stiffen up a little bit. Um, th these are the ones we use when we're worried or when there's danger around or, or when something's negative that we don't like. Now, we're not consciously aware of that. Some people are. Okay, we, we'll, we'll talk about, I don't know if you watched the show Lie to Me. You can learn what these signals are, these so-called micro expressions, and you can learn to consciously detect them. They're very, very, very hard, it takes a ton of time. But we're all pretty good at unconsciously detecting it. We can all kind of say, yeah, you know, this is what they told me, but I wasn't buying it. Why weren't you buying it? You know, here's where you were listening to the words that they were saying, and it was coming in, but the unconscious mind was watching the body. And the unconscious mind was saying, hey, don't trust those words. And so, yeah, we have a conscious representation of the words, but we also have that emotional um, feeling around the words that says, yeah, but I think the person was lying. That feeling comes from the unconscious mind. We can't always say why. You know, we're like, I'm not sure why I think they were lying, but I think they were lying. Um, and that's because it comes from the unconscious mind. So if we read this again, ah. Uh, Things in our unconscious mind can trigger habitual be behaviors, but can also bias the way things appear in consciousness. This seems to be the way our mind works. We can only be conscious of a limited number of things. And so that's what we're actually aware of. But that awareness is also f affected by the unconscious mind, which can perceive a whole lot more stuff at once um, and, and can, in fact, bias the way our conscious perception emerges. I hope, that, I hope that was more simplifying than complexifying, <laughs> but, I, but I want you to have this, understand that, this understanding that both the conscious and the unconscious mind are critical to what we do. The unconscious mind controls all sorts of habits, meaning we don't have to worry about them. Um, the conscious mind is where we do all our strategic thinking, but the unconscious mind even informs the conscious mind. Um, and, and it helps shape it, but it does so in ways that we don't always appreciate because it comes from the unconscious mind, right? We embrace our conscious mind. We think, we think this is who we are, but in fact, this is who we are. And the unconscious mind is, is often doing a lot more than we give it credit for, that we understand. It's the source of all the emotional sort of reactions we have to things and the way they bias our behavior. And we are more emotional beings than we are intellectual. We don't like to think of ourselves that way, but that's what we are. So, okay. <laughs> All of this, again, if we kind of leave this world a little bit, the, the purpose of this lecture, again, was, was multifold. You know, one was to try to make that diagram make a little bit more sense to you and, and to show you where some of the claims came from. Secondly, I wanted to give you a real clear sense of how you can do experiments on things like attention and consciousness. So you saw a couple of concrete ones there. And in delivering the experiments, I also wanted to kind of show you how our understanding develops as we do more experiments, often that have higher levels of complexity, you know, allowing us to detect, Ike's experiment allowed us to detect the fact that the, oh, I almost should have went back there. <laughs> A critical point of Ike's experiment is that in order for the primes to affect how you heard things, you had to process the primes a lot more deeply than Broadbent said, right? So for prints to make you hear air as H-E-I-R, you have to have processed prints all the way to the point where you recognize that as a royal um, title because that's what connects to H-E-I-R. So Broadbent said, oh, we only get the rough physical characteristics. No, according to Ike, we actually process unattended information very deeply, all the way to its meaning, and the meaning can bias our conscious perception. Um, and so the Ike experiment shows that that early filter that Broadbent suggested was wrong. The filter is, in fact, much, much later um, than than. Broadbent suggested. So I wanted you to get that sense too, how experiments can kind of build on one another and enhance our understanding and then ultimately bring us to the place represented by that diagram. Okay. Hope that was useful. Thanks. Bye-bye.